and welcome to week six, day two of Quantum Physics for Everyone, sponsored by the Center for Integrated Quantum Materials at Harvard and the University of Oregon. This is our very last session, so today we will try to apply what we've learned so far in the summer term, and we will discuss um, quantum operations, quantum devices, which allow us to implement quantum state teleportation and quantum computing. We will not have a, any demos today because it's too hard to demonstrate those two things in a teaching laboratory. So to review, we have seen the, the important concept of composite objects, which simply means a collection of two or more objects treated together and each object can be a qubit, which could be represented by two photons. I just say the pair is represented by two photons or the composite object could be represented by two electrons or any, any other two quantum objects. Uh, and we use the ampersand or the and symbol to indicate that we're combining these the states of these two objects into one object. And it's very important in quantum mechanics that you do that. As we'll see, you cannot think of separating um, th this pair of objects into two separate objects, not in the general case. Sometimes you can, the way I've shown it here is simply a, a, a state that can be represented um, as the state of this one and the state of this one. But as you know, if I take quantum superposition states involving more than one of these, then I can no longer do that. So we'll discuss that in more detail. We can uh, implement this uh, using uh, polarization notation, uh, V and H. And by the way, this is also polarization of photons. But we also know that uh, the, the, these qubits could, rep could be represented by any two state object. So we discussed quantum entanglement and we said that if a, if a composite state can be expressed as a definite state of each object, such as this, then this state is not entangled. However, if you have a state which is a superposition of two composite states, then in general, this cannot be written in the form of two separate states like up above and this state is entangled. And this is, for example, the, the Bell state that Henning used in his laboratory demos to show the violation of the Bell inequalities. And by the way, you can prove that it's impossible to violate the Bell inequality, namely the average of Q should be less than two. It's impossible to violate that statement unless you use entangled quantum states. And I showed last time that quantum theory predicts perfectly the correlations that are observed in these Bell test experiments. So here's a zoom poll. And I will go to the polling right now. This is actually a repeat. Everybody certainly got the answer to this one correct. So we can move on. H poll as shown here, when Bob sees V, he can rule out this other possibility, even though Alice doesn't know anything about what Bob is doing. Alice thinks the state is still the entangled state, but Bob now knows that it's no longer the entangled state. Alice would not know that unless Bob picks up the telephone and calls her and tells her that. There's no way she could know Okay, here's the next one, zoom pull two. Mm-hmm. 
good. I will end that poll because everybody got this one correct as well. So again, if Bob gets V, he can rule out this one, but now he knows that the state that corresponds to the, the allowed state is H for Alice, which is a linear superposition of DNA. So she'll, she'll see equal chances. Good. Okay, quantum teleportation, our favorite TV show from the 1960s, which I used to watch when I was in high school. And no, you cannot teleport human bodies. It's um, impossible. And we, we know that because we know how teleportation works. And we know that in order to teleport any object, you need to send all the information about that object across space. And the amount of information in a human body is simply too large because you would have to represent all this information for every single proton, neutron, and electron in the body. And that would be too much information to ever send across any channel within a billion years, for example. However, we can do quantum teleportation for simple objects like single electron or single photon, or even now, now sometimes the state of an electron within an atom. So how does this work? So this cartoon I made up is Professor Xavier, and the professor creates uh, the state psi of some object, let's say a photon. Now, Alice doesn't know what the state is because the professor does not tell her. But the professor sends that photon to Alice's lab and says, please teleport this state over to Bob. And Alice says, but I don't know what the state is. And the professor says, oh, that's okay. Just follow this protocol. So the protocol is there has to be pre-shared or pre-entangled objects within this uh, quantum um, device or memory and, and, and entangle with one over here. And this has to be arranged in advance. So like yesterday, Alice and Bob uh, created this entanglement across space. So then what Alice does is she sends uh, this object into this measurement device along with the professor's object. And then Alice makes a measurement of the, of the joint properties of, this, of these two objects. That measurement does not tell her what the state of this object is. Then she calls Bob up on a telephone with classical communication and tells Bob some information about what she observed in this measurement. And then Bob says, oh, thank you very much. He takes his quantum object that was previously entangled with this other one and he applies some kind of a unitary transformation like a half wave plate um, polarization a switcher or something like that. And then this object now is magically produced in the same state that the professor's original object was. And notice that this process consumes the, the particle or the object that the professor had. So that's like in, in the movies, when, when the body disintegrates, it's no longer there. Now you don't send this object across space. The only thing that's sent across is classical communication. So Bob had this object over here, which had to be the same type of object. If this was a photon, this has to be a photon. And then he applies a unitary transformation to this photon. And this photon now is in the same state that the professor's object was in. But it's not the same photon, it's a new photon. Good. So we're gonna go through this in detail. Now the question is, is this process instantaneous? Well, Alice makes a measurement. She uses a telephone channel, calls Bob. So no, it's not instantaneous because this classical communication cannot travel faster than the speed of light. So there's always a delay. Okay. So let's see how this works in some, in some detail. First, I want to explain how a classical simulator of teleportation would work. It's very simple. Consider first this kind of device. 
the rules of this device is that if if there, there's two coins, each one can be um, heads or tails. If Bob's coin is heads, then this device causes the state of Alice's coin to do nothing, just to remain the same. But if Bob's coin is tails, then this device instructs Alice's coin to flip its state. So the rule is that only if Bob's coin is tails does this device cause an instruction which flips the state of Alice's coin. Okay, so here's the question. What will happen if Bob's coin is in a quantum superposition of heads and tails, which I represent by a spinning coin here? So this could be a coin. Of course, this is impossible for a coin, but if it were an electron and Bob's <clears throat> object were an, also an electron, which was in a superposition of clockwise and counterclockwise uh, spinning states, then what would this device do to Alice's quantum object? What would be the state that comes out here? Well, The answer would be, so we have vertical polarizations and we have horizontal polarizations indicated by these arrows. And I've shown up here the basic examples, two basic examples. And so just to get yourself clear on what the rules are, fill in these blank state spaces, <clears throat> these parentheses, You can just draw little arrows. <clears throat> in these blank spaces. Good, I'm seeing all correct answers drawn there. So I'm going to move on. So you get the idea how the drawings work. Very good. Let me move back to the keynote and just put in here what, what my answers were. So we can draw that, we can write them over here or we can write them over here. Um, we can do that because there's a definite state for each of the particles. So I can write the state of this one here and, and I can write it here, the other one here. And I can combine those with an and symbol. But notice that these are not entangled states. This is not an entangled state. This is not an entangled state. That's why I can label each of these particles separately with its own state. Okay, so we understand what this device does. U means it's a unitary operation. And this is called a C not gate, C N O T, which means controlled not. The reason it's called not is because like in logic, if you represent uh, true by horizontal, here's, true is horizontal and then say false is vertical, then the B, the state of the B object uh, controls a not operation. Not means true goes to false or false goes to true. Okay, so we'll see that in the computing context later. But for the teleportation context, we don't need to think about nots and, and logic. Okay, let's consider what would happen now if Alice's photon is vertical and Bob's photon is in the diagonal <clears throat> state. And it goes through the same device. So let me run a poll here, number three.
Okay. <clears throat> we have some correct answers and, and some not sure. So if, if this uh, photon of Bob's were strictly vertical, or if it were strictly horizontal, then the A photon would come out in a definite state and Bob's you know, state would just go through, as we saw in the previous slides. But since Bob's uh, state is neither vertical nor horizontal, you can think of that as a linear superposition of horizontal and vertical. And this, since this is a unitary device, it means that both options happen. And so you, you generate this state like this. So here's how you can think of it. Alice's state is vertical, Bob's is diagonal. But, but, but we can write that state as a sum of these two states. We saw this last session, something similar. The diagonal is represented for Bob as horizontal plus vertical. Now each of these state components goes through the device separately. So this component goes through and nothing happens. The horizontal Bob state does not affect the Alice's state. But the vertical Bob's state causes Alice's uh, polarization to rotate by minus 90, 90 degrees. But you still maintain the quantum superposition. So this is the final state of these two objects. And notice, I cannot write up here the state of Alice's photon and down here the state of Bob's photon. I can only write this state at the output as a composite state. Okay, so zoom pull. Okay, so th there, there's not, uh, not complete agreement on this. So let me just explain it further. The state that's shown here, let me annotate this. The states that, that is shown here is not equal to some state for Alice and some other state, call it psi prime for Bob. I, I cannot write this that way. And as I said at the beginning of this session, if I cannot write a state as a definite state for Alice and a definite state for Bob, then that means it is an entangled state. That's the definition of an entangled state. Therefore, the answer is yes, this is entangled. What is the name of the state? I'll let you think about it. There's no poll question. Do you remember what the name of the state is and how we used it previously? So it's V and H plus minus H and V. And in fact, this is the Bell state. So this device, we call a Bell state generator. I start from two photons over here, which are not entangled. Each one has a definite state. I run them through this device and it creates the bell state over here. This is a very useful device. It's, it's the most important device in all of quantum computing, I would say. Because it creates entanglement where previously there was no entanglement. Okay, so as we said, the um, entangled state is, is one that provides a complete quantum description of the whole combined entity but cannot be divided into separate complete descriptions of each separate part. And this is the, the Bell state here. Now, you might think that because we have all these different possibilities, H and V, uh, that there wouldn't be any measurement I could make for which I know precisely the, the answer. In other words, if you think in terms of eigenstate, is, is this state an eigenstate of, any, of anything, of any quantity? Well, yes, there, there is one state, uh, there's one quantity that I can, that I can define. If I have a, a machine here, which takes in my composite object, and if it's in this state with a plus sign, it goes up this way. If it's in this state with a minus sign, which is different than that state, because these are mutually exclusive. Remember last session, we showed even you can represent these states as perpendicular arrows in a four dimensional state space. The fact that they're perpendicular means they're mutually 
exclusive. And because they're mutually exclusive, there should be some physical machine you, you can build to sort them into two possible outcomes. And then you could put detectors here or something. So, you know, for a single photon, this would just be a, a calcite crystal. But for a pair of photons as the comp object, it'd be something much more complicated. But they do exist. So it is possible if I prepare this state then I, and I put it through this, I know it's gonna go down this way with, with probability equal to one. So there, there is such a measurement I could make, but, but only this, this one measurement, okay. So now we're gonna do something in the reverse called the Bell State Verifier. Previously, if we ran system, uh, photons from left to right, that was called a Bell State Generator. But if we start on the right-hand side with, the, with a Bell State, let's say we produced it by using one of these devices and we, over here on the right, we want to verify, is this really the bell state? How can I do that? Well, here's how you build that device. You just run these two photons backwards through this exactly the same device that you used before. It could be a copy of the, of the same device. It doesn't have to be the actual device. So you get another identical device. You run the photons through it backwards. And if the photons are in this bell state, with, with the, the minus H over here for Alice's photon, then it exactly reverses or undoes what a Bell state generator would do. And it spits out at the output going leftward, vertical for Alice and diagonal for Bob. That's just the inverse of the generator process. Now to verify that this is, is the correct state or was the state, we now just have to measure the polarization of Alice's photon uh, you, using the HV uh, measurement scheme, and it should go up here, say V, check mark. And then we use a DA calcite here to, to prove that this is D, not A. So we get a check mark here, which means it's DNA. So if these two detectors click, the upper one here and the upper one here, then we know that we had started with the Bell state on the right hand side. That's why it's called a Bell state verifier. So let's do a, a, a poll question. So now Bob does not let his photon go through the device. Instead, he grabs his photon over here and he just makes a measurement on it. And Alice takes the photon from over here. There's no device anymore because there's only, Alice only has one photon. Alice takes her photon from this state here and, and measures it using a, 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 a DA scheme. And what happens is because the state's in, entangled, it's similar to a previous question we had. Let's say, but it's, there's two possibilities. Let's say Bob took his photon and measured it. So let's say Bob got V, that's this one. If that's the case, it's gonna rule out this possibility and that's gonna leave Alice with an H polarized photon, which she now measures with the DA scheme over here. And you know what that's gonna do, right? The other possibility is Bob measures his photon and he finds it to be V. That rules out this one and leaves Alice with a, v. sorry, sorry, I said A, I said B. Bob gets H. That rules out this one, leaves Alice with a V polarized photon. Then she measures it with the DA scheme and now you know what's gonna happen, right? So I'm gonna run this poll again because not everybody got the answer Exactly correct. So please run that again. Mm -hmm. 
we still don't have complete agreement, but we have mostly agreement. And the, the answer is equal chances for DNA. And quickly, it's because if Bob gets this one, V, Alice is an H, which we know gives equal probability for DNA. If Bob gets H, then he knows that Alice is in V, which also has equal probabilities for DNA, because V is a linear superposition of D and A. So, hope you all see that. Moving on. So notice that without using this device and without both uh, Bob and Alice sending their photons through this device backwards or right to left, there's no way that they can do any measurements over here uh, th that will guarantee that they can both predict their outcomes with 100% certainty. But if they have the device and they run backwards through, they can predict exactly that these two upper detectors will click. That's quite a big difference. <clears throat> now we can use this device to do quantum state teleportation. Okay, so the, the goal is, as I said before, Alice has been given a photon. This photon here state was prepared by Professor Xavier and it happens to be drawn this way. It doesn't matter, I just randomly picked an angle, okay? Could be any angle. And the professor knows it, but Alice and Bob don't know what the state is. So, Bob has a photon that he, he's, he's got previously and Alice has a photon that she had previously. So there's three photons in total. Now Bob wants to change the state of his photon. So it's gonna be the same that the professor handed to Alice. Now Alice cannot send her photon past this line, but she can telephone Bob and send information to him. And, and she, say she can send other photons to him but when I say that, what I meant was that Alice and Bob can previously share some entangled photons before this experiment is started. So let's first consider this in, in a classical scenario. So let's say Alice, which I say you have a coin, but you don't know its state, could be heads or tails. Now Alice cannot send her coin past this line, but she can share other, other coins with Bob earlier in a special Co correlated configuration. So here's how she does it. There's a source here which produces pairs of coins which are correlated but still random. In other words, this source could, could send Alice an H and H. No, no, sorry. This, the, the coins could be H and H, in which case Alice gets an H one here on the A photon and Bob gets an H on the B. Or this source could send T and T, which means tails goes to Alice and tails goes to Bob. And that, that, that coin can go across this boundary. And this could be done in, in advance, okay? So now here's the professor and he flips the coin and gets the state X, which could be either heads or tails, but he doesn't tell anybody what that is. Now there's a device here that Alice has. She takes uh, the unknown state in and this other unknown state and she compares them. And just based on that information, she can call up Bob and tell him what to do to his coin to get his coin in the same state that the unknown coin was in, even though he and Alice never know what that state was. They could all check all this later, but at the time they don't know anything. So here's how they do it. Alice, uh, well, the professor flips the coin, okay. The source generates a pair, this is what I just said. Alice takes her two coins and the comparator tells her, because it's a nice machine, it says these two coins are the same or it tells her these two coins are different. If the comparator says different, Alice tells Bob to switch his coin. Otherwise, Alice tells him not to switch his coin. Now, Bob looks at the coin and these two, these two, um, coins have been um, consumed. The comparator compares them and then destroy the coins. However, the professor knows what the state of the X particle originally was, the coin. So then Bob gets the state over here and talks and then checks later with the professor and they say, oh, it always agrees perfectly. 
Now you can do this experiment yourself. Just get, get a, uh, a friend and try the experiment. It works every time. So here's the quantum version of that. Instead of having correlated coins, we have entangled photons. So the, the source sends out this bell state, V and H plus minus H and V. And that's the A and the B photon. So the B photon goes to Bob. He has that photon, but it's in some weird entangled state that's not of any use to him. Uh, the professor pr produces this unknown state, X, and sends it over to Alice. Alice runs it backwards through a Bell state verifier. Now there's four possible combinations. Here's the calcites. This object, you know, this device does the Bell state operation on it, the controlled knot operation. And then Alice measures the upper photon with a VH analyzer and the lower photon with a DA analyzer. Now there's four possible combinations, right? One, two, three, four. Here's the four combinations of what could be observed. So she gets some information because this comparator has, has given her information. It, it's one of these four possibilities. Okay. That's what this little description tells us. Now, what's going to happen? Alice can call up Bob on the telephone and give him the information about which outcome she observed, one, two, three, or four. Now at this point, if, if you know quantum theory well enough, you can, you can see that Bob now knows something about, um, nothing about this photon because the, this photon here can be, well, how should I say it? <laughs> yes, Bob knows something about this photon, the B photon, because he knew that it was originally entangled with the A photon. He knew that Alice did this comparator operation. Alice told him, what the result was, so he's gained information. So he now knows that his photon is one of these four states. That's not quite right um, because he doesn't know what the original state was, but he knows that it's one of four states that is related in a very definite way to the original state, the unknown state. I should say that if the professor is sitting here and he knows what the state is and he listens in to what Alice got, then the professor knows now precisely what the state over here is. But Bob doesn't know that because he doesn't know the original state. But he knows something, right? So what can he do? Just like flipping the coin, what he'll do is, if the result is, is a four, which is VA on this side, then he knows already that, his, that this photon has, has forgotten its original entangled state and has now um, been, we say, remotely prepared uh, in the same state that the professor's photon originally was in, which has now been destroyed in, in the uh, comparator or the CNOT gate. So that means that Bob just does nothing and then he's guaranteed to get the same state that the professor prepared, even though Bob doesn't know what the state is. He could compare that with, uh, with the professor and on the phone and they say, oh yeah, okay, we got the same state, that's great. Now, if, um, if Alice gets result one, which is V and D, then what he does is he knows his state is over here relative to the original state. So he just has to flip it using a half wave plate across the vertical axis. So this arrow here becomes the state. If Alice gets either two or three as the result, then she, she tells him, you know, which one she got. And then he either rotates the state by min minus 90 degrees, or he flips the state with a wave plate, then rotates it. So there's some nice little procedures he can do. There's one of four different procedures he could do. And he does the correct procedure. And now he knows that this photon has been prepared in exactly the same state that the professor's photon was in, even though he and Alice never know the state. So that's quantum teleportation. Notice the photon that the professor created is never sent across this barrier. Only these resource entangled photons are, are sent across the barrier, plus the classical communication information sent across the barrier. Okay. So entanglement is needed for teleportation and we call it a quantum resource. So entangled particles is something you would pay money for. Alice and Bob would um, order up 
a million entangled particles that may be from their, their quantum IT provider, the quantum Verizon. And Verizon would distribute these uh, entangled pairs in advance and they would store them in, a, in their quantum memories in, in their quantum modem at home. And then as soon as um, the professor produced a photon, Alice would do the measurement and then send an email to Bob, you know, do one of these four things. And Bob would, would grab one of those entangled photons and, and do the flipping thing and would get the, get the correct state. So I say it's something you would, you would pay for just like you pay an IT provider. That's why we call it a resource. Cool. Now what happens if Alice does not make this phone call. The line is broken and she cannot make the phone call, but everything else is done the same. Okay, the question is as stated. Let's launch that poll. Communication works by causal effects. Like I'm speaking now and the energy in my sound waves goes into the microphone. That energy is transported across the internet through laser pulses. And that causes then, uh, you know, your speaker to respond. And all that happens, you know, at, at most the speed of light, okay. Now go back to the example of the coins, okay? Just think, rethink this question in terms of coins. The two coins go up from the source. One goes to Alice, one goes to Bob. Now Bob has a coin. It, there it is. When Alice makes the comparator measurement and she gets her result, she learns something about the relation between the X coin and the A coin. But Bob doesn't know anything about what Alice did. For all Bob knows, Alice went to sleep and never made the measurement. So Bob's coin is still sitting there. It hasn't changed. So by that analogy, I'm gonna end this poll and I'm going to relaunch the poll because not everybody clicked on the same answer. Cool, now everybody clicked on the same answer and it's the one I agree with. It's not a causal effect. Nothing happens to the, the, the particle state over here. Well, <laughs> this is very subtle actually, right? Nothing physically happens to the particle here as long as Alice doesn't tell Bob to do something with a flipper rotator to that particle. So Alice, the, the funny thing is, is now, now Alice has some extra information about Bob's photon, but Bob doesn't know that information yet. So in some sense, Alice has a different quantum state description of Bob's photon than Bob has description of Bob's photon. Because the only thing Bob knows about the photon is that it was prepared in this entangled state. And he's, that's all he still knows. Now there's been no causal influence. If there were, then you could use this method to send information faster than the speed of light. And we know that's not possible if you believe relativity. And quantum theory is completely compatible with relativity. So the conclusion is that this is a very subtle, deep conclusion. Alice has a, a quantum state in mind that she's using to describe Bob's photon, but Bob has a different quantum state in mind that he's using to describe the photon. So the conclusion is that a quantum state is not really a property of a photon. It's actually a description of the condition of the photon and two people may hold in their mind two different quantum states describing the same photon. 
and they're both correct. So quantum state really represents information. It does not represent the actual condition of a particle. And that's important when you think about quantum communication and quantum computing. Quantum states are very slippery things. They're not like classical states. Okay, so back to practical things. Um, remember I said earlier, I, I showed exactly how this, this works. Or, uh, well, I talked about it, but now it's just to remind you that uh, quantum Verizon would have distributed, um, well, actually this, yeah, quantum Verizon has, and, and Verizon did not pay me for this advertisement. I just thought of it. Uh, quantum Verizon has these, um, these uh, quantum satellites up in the sky, which by the way, um, NASA is working uh, to build these uh, satellites now. I, I've been consulting with NASA on this project. And so the quantum satellite will send down entangled photons and Bob will store one in his quantum memory and Alice will store one in her. Actually, they might store millions of them, but they just need one pair. When the professor generates a state psi, he sends it to Alice Alice takes one entangled particle from the memory, does a joint measurement, calls up Bob. Bob takes a, another entangled photon from here, does the unitary transformation, and boom, gets the right state. And the main point is that the quantum satellite never knows anything. It's, it's totally ignorant. It just provides entangled uh, particles across the, across the ocean. This has not been done yet. This experiment has not been done. Uh, we're working with NASA to try to get the funding in order to do this experiment. Now we'll discuss quantum computers. So we're going to try to apply many of the concepts we've discussed up to now to, to get an insight into how quantum computers might work. So first, what is a computer? It's a machine that takes information in, processes, information according to a program and then creates a resulting output which is in the form of information. Now remember I, I just talked about teleportation and pointed out that quantum information is something very different than classical information because classical information you could write down on a piece of paper but quantum information you cannot write down on a piece of paper. The only way you can represent quantum information is with a qubit, which means you need a single electron or a single photon, and you need to prepare it in a quantum state. That is quantum information. And you can teleport that state across without sending the particle, or you can just ship the particle across. It's two different ways to transfer quantum information but it's always a quantum state that you're transferring. Okay. And that's the same inside of a quantum computer. The information moves around either by moving qubits physically or by teleporting the state from one point in the computer to another point in the computer. Okay, so let's first talk about classical computers. Well, I like to represent this by a light switch. An ordinary bit or digital bit is either up or down, on or off, zero or one. But in a quantum computer, we know we can have superpositions. So if you think in terms of light switches, you could have up in superposition with down. So in terms of logical bit values, you could have both one uh, in superposition with zero. I, I don't call this symbol and, because remember and refers to a composite object. This is only one object, it's one light switch. It can either be up or down, or in quantum mechanics, it could be in a superposition with. So the plus symbol means in superposition with. But now if I measure this quantum object, I'm gonna get either one or zero, and that's true randomness. That, that's our true random number generator, which is the one that Henning demonstrated with the photons. And uh, in a, a state arrow representation, I could represent the, the zero uh, bit value by, by this arrow pointing at the zero. And I could use another arrow, which is a perpendicular to the other one pointing at the one. 
And again, this is just state space. It's a mathematical abstract representation. Okay. Now, if I have, uh, if I have um, two memory cells within this green box, there's four possible combinations classically. I could have down, down, which is a zero, zero, or I could have zero, one, or I could have one, zero, or I could have one, one. And classically, there's four possible states of these two switches. But I can only store one of these four possibilities at a given time with, within one of these uh, cells that contains two memory cells. I have a typo down here, I see. Okay, now here we have two quantum bits. And again, I can have the down, down, you know, the down, up, the up, up. But now I can put these four possible states into superposition with each other. And this is like the bell state. It's like, well, this is the bell state here it would be down, up, in superposition with up, down. But we can also add in these other ones the down, down, and the up, up. So there's four possible states, which are mutually exclusive, but I can make a quantum superposition state that has a non-zero probability to observe any of these four possibilities if I make a measurement of the two qubits. And I can represent all of these simultaneously with, with uh, different levels of probability for each one. Whereas in classical physics, you could only represent one of these states with, with a given pair of switches. Okay. So if there are 10 switches instead of two, how many unique combinations are there? Well, it's two to the 10, because each one has two possibilities. I just multiply those to get all the different combinations which is about a thousand. If there are 50 switches, which is typical now for a quantum computer within the next few years, we'll have quantum computers with 50 really good switches. We now have really good quantum computers which about, with about 30 switches with a high quality. Other companies have quantum computers with hundreds of switches, but they're of low quality. So let's stay with the high quality ones. Well, with 50 high quality switches and no decoherence, you could represent two to the 50 different possible states, all in superposition and with only 50 switches. Well, that's a very big number. I can't even say that number, it's so big. But all those states could be represented with some certain probability or possibility within the same physical device containing only 50 electrons. Okay. Cool. Now let, let's go back to classical digital computers again. So most of you have, are probably somewhat familiar with the idea of classical logic gates, they're called, they're logic operations, and they're implemented by semiconductor uh, electronics, you know, transistors. And there's a not operation which takes any input A and just negates it to make the output. And here's the logic table, the truth table. Zero goes to one, one goes to zero. Okay, here's the and operation. The and operation um, gives, it, 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 it gives a one only if both A and B are equal to one at the input. Now notice there's two inputs and only one output. That's how classical computers work. So this is not reversible. You see, if the output is zero, I don't know what the two inputs were because the inputs have been destroyed, destroyed. So it's not reversible. The, the not gate is reversible, but not the and and the or gate. So the or gate, it should be called the either or gate because it gives a one if either or a or B or both, it should be called the either or or both gate. Okay, so that's, with these kind of three gates, any logic operation can be made. Any digital computer can be constructed just with these simple operations. 
So here's my cartoon for how a uh, digital computer works. You have uh, input registers uh, where you have one number, say it's five, this is binary, one, one plus uh, four is five. This is binary for two, uh, zero plus two is two. So you put these two uh, you know, s strings of binary numbers in, which are just represented in electronics by say voltages. Each one of these wires can either be zero volts or five volts. Okay, then they run through all these gates here and they spit out an answer. In this case, it's an adding machine. So it generates seven, which is one plus two plus four. And just to show how the math looks, these are called the place values in, in binary. The detail is not important, okay? Um, another kind of gate is called exclusive OR, X OR. And it has the uh, operation that if either A or B, but not both, equals one, the output is one. Okay, exclusive OR. This one can actually be constructed by using uh, combinations of the three previous ones, but sometimes th this is useful by itself. Okay. Um, one, another way to build a classical computer is just to use the XOR along with the AND gate. You just need two of them. You don't need three, you actually just need two. And you can prove that any set of logic operations can be implemented just using these two gates. Okay, quantum computers operate using qubits. And as we know, you can encode that with different photon states like zero one or zero plus one, H, V, or D. Or you could encode that in the position of an electron. This could be a capacitor and the electron could be on the right side or the left side of the capacitor to encode a zero or a one. Um, electron in a superposition of both encodes a superposition, or you could use electron spin. It could be spinning counterclockwise or clockwise. And again, you could have the linear quantum superposition state. Okay. So the quantum computer uses what's called a quantum XOR gate. Okay. The rule is that B, the B qubit controls what happens to the A qubit and the B qubit goes through without changing. Zero goes to zero, 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 one goes to one, one goes to one. If the B qubit is zero, then nothing happens to the A qubit. See, zero, the one remains a one, or B is zero, the zero remains zero. But if B, the control bit is one, then the, the A bit value flips from zero to one. And remember, those are not values, those are quantum states. So when I say value, I mean quantum state. Here, if the B uh, qubit is in the one state and, and the A is in the one state, then the A gets flipped to the zero state. And here's the, the classical logic table. It looks like the exclusive OR, doesn't it? Because if either A or B is one, you, the output is one, but if both A and B are one, the output is zero. So this is called a quantum exclusive OR gate, quantum XOR gate. <clears throat> this device is also the Bell state generator. That's why I went through so much detail on teleportation to explain what the Bell state generator does. Of course, I have never told you how these devices work. We don't have time for that. But it depends on the particular kind of qubit that you're dealing with. So it turns out to build a quantum computer, you just need two kind of quantum gates. You need the quantum XOR and one more, which is called the quantum rotate. Remember in classical computers, we, we needed the XOR and the, and the not, no, the XOR along with the AND gate. Uh, here we, we need the XOR along with a different gate called rotate, which I'll explain in a minute. Then just with those two gates, you can, you can cascade those operations and create any quantum computer program. Okay, so here is a poll question. What happens if the qubit A is in state one and qubit B is in the superposition state zero plus one? Uh, 
I'm getting a range of different answers here. In fact, I got the complete spread. I got A, B, C, and D as possible answers that people voted on. So that means this is, is a little bit harder. So let, let me talk through this a bit here. So remember the rule is that if the B qubit is zero, then nothing happens to the A qubit. If the B qubit is one, the A qubit gets flipped. So the trick is what you do is you take the superposition and you consider the two possibilities. So you first consider B along with A. In other words, if you take one A and this zero plus one B, you can write that as one A zero B plus, which means in superposition with one A one B. And then you treat each of those separately. So you treat the one A zero B going through, and then you say plus, what would happen if you had the one A one B going through? So you consider those two possibilities and you, then you superpose them at the output. So I'm gonna end that poll and I'm gonna relaunch it. Okay, I'm gonna move on here. Uh, right. Three people said D, which is correct. Now it can't be C because again, that would, that would represent a non-entangled state because I can say the A state is one plus zero and, which is ampersand, the B state is zero plus one. That is not an entangled state because I can write it as a state for A and a state for B. Whereas D is correct because it's an entangled state. Now, the only trick is, you know, is it E or is it D? Okay, well, it is D because when, if you look at the component, this 1A, 0B, that component has a zero for the B. So the A is not changed. So the A remains one and the B remains zero. So it's true that the B state doesn't change, but it, that's true component by component, not for the whole state. That, that's the, the mathematical trick here. And then the other component is A is one, B is one. So now B is one, so it flips the A. So now A is zero, B is one. Here it is, zero and one. So this is the entangled state, and this is like a Bell state. So again, we've taken uh, two, two input states that are not entangled, although one of them is a superposition, and we've created out here this, this um, entangled Bell state. Good, that, that's really crucial. That example right there is the most important example in all of quantum computing, I would say, because once you understand what these plus and these and symbols mean and that these rules of the gate operate component by component, then you can predict correctly what happens. And that's how it really happens. There it is, proof. Now people have done these experiments, of course, with electrons and photons and, and so on. And they work. Okay, cool. So the, this top uh, four uh, uh, lines here are the classical uh, rules that would apply even to uh, classical switches. But I've added one more rule here, which is the, the quantum logic table. And of course, in, in reality, there, there, there's more uh, quantum examples you could give, but I just wanted to fill out one more row in the, in the logic table. And again, th these are not values of bits. Th these are quantum states. 1A means a quantum state. Zero B means a quantum state. And this is how the, the quantum states get altered when they transfer through the quantum XOR gate. Okay. So here's a poll question. Okay, five seconds. Okay, we'll, we'll end there. So yes, th this is reversible and unitary. In some sense, that's what unitary means, is it happens with no disturbance from the outside world. And therefore, uh, if you reverse the process, it just undoes what it did before. So that's a very key point uh, about quantum computers is all the operations are reversible. Now, in classical computers, they're not reversible, as I said earlier, because there are typically two inputs and only one output. So knowing the output does not allow the device to uh, 
figure out what inputs were if if the inputs are erased. And in quantum physics, the inputs are always erased because remember when you when you do a unitary transformation, it changes the state. So, but you can figure out if you have the right state. If you if you guess the state, you can check it with a Bell state verifier. Just run this backwards. Okay. So all quantum gates are reversible and unitary. But that also means in order for it to be unitary, you cannot look inside what's happening, right? Because remember when we talked about quantum interference, even with one quantum uh, object, if you observe what's happening as the process is taking place, it's no longer unitary. You, you, you make the particle continuously forget what state it, it was in before, and that certainly would not be reversible. So you have to keep this object, I mean, this, this device inside of a dark container. You typically have to cool it down to close to zero degrees, absolute zero, so that there's no thermal uh, vibrations of the atoms uh, around it that could perturb the electron or the photon. Actually, that's true for electrons. So when you see those common pictures of quantum computers, they're always coated with gold they have a million wires, and that, that whole thing is stuck in, inside of a liquid helium cryostat and cooled down to absolute zero, nearly. Uh, that's because electrons are very susceptible to vibrations caused by the surrounding atoms. And if you cool them down, you, you can eliminate those vibrations. However, for photons, it turns out you don't have to cool it. That's a really cool thing about photon quantum computers is you can operate them uh, in a laboratory with the with the room lights on, um, just like Henning did. Remember, he was doing experiments with photons going through a Michelson interferometer. We well, didn't have to turn off the room lights. Uh, he just had to make sure that his detectors uh, weren't exposed to room lights. But the photons that were doing the quantum operations, they they could be traveling through the air. Um, and, and, and uh, with the room lights on. That's because photons are interacting very, very weakly with their environment. Their quantum state is not perturbed when a photon travels through air, even if the air is quite warm. So that's one advantage of, of photon-based quantum computers. All right. So now we need two quantum gates to build a computer. One is the XOR gate that we just discussed. The other is the quantum rotate gate. Let's see what that is. Okay, so it works on a single qubit. Now remember back in the classical computer, we had the not gate, whereas the value of A was just switched. So if, it was, if A was zero, it went through the not gate and became one. If the input was one, it goes through and comes out as a zero. So it, it just switches it to the uh, mutually exclusive value. Well, in quantum physics, remember mutually exclusive means that the state arrows are perpendicular. Ah, wait a second, I, got, I have to be careful here. Um, this is not the perfect analogy of a not gate because what it does is it takes a state arrow and it rotates it counterclockwise by 45 degrees. And remember, it's really implemented with a half wave plate. If, if these are photons, it's implemented with a half wave plate, uh, which, which effectively rotates the angle of the state arrow or the polarization arrow by 45 degrees. Now notice that this new state is, is not mutually exclusive to this original state. So this is not the perfect analogy of a classical not gate. It's a little bit different, but it's still a very necessary gate for quantum computing. So thinking about this rule that it rotates, whatever state you put in, it rotates it by minus 45 degrees. Think about over here, what would this vertical one state be converted to if it goes through the quantum rotate operation? Well, the answer, of course, is it just gets rotated by minus, minus 44, 45 degrees. So going back to classical computer, any calculation can be done only one at a time. So if I want to add two numbers, like 0 plus 0 equals the 1, I have to put them in and get the answer. 
if I want to add one, uh, one plus zero, I put it in and I get the answer. If I want to add one plus one equals two, I put them in, I get the answer. But I cannot do all these computations simultaneously if I have only one processor. But the trick with quantum computing is you put the input register into superpositions. So this qubit is in a superposition of zero and one, and the other qubit is zero in superposition zero one. And so now you see I have four combinations. I have zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. All those go into the quantum processor and all these computations are uh, processed at least according to the unitary operations. They're processed at the same time and you then you spit out the results. Um, okay. But the problem is I think I drew this wrong here. I should have had four photons. No, 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 that's right. I have, I have, I have um, yeah, I probably have, should have four photons here going in and four photons coming out. But these other two photons would just be in the zero state, zeros and zero. So you have four photons coming out and you want to figure out what, what is the answer to all four of these problems. Well, it turns out you cannot do that, unfortunately. So even though the quantum processor does parallel processing, when you read it out, you only get one of the answers. So it's very subtle to know, well, which answer did you get? Is it the answer to any question that you care about? Or is it just some crazy quantum superposition? Because even though these are in a, a four particle entangled state, when you now measure each one of these in the zero one measurement scheme, you just get numbers like zero, one, one, zero, or one, one, zero, one. You just get results. Now that may represent an answer to a problem you care about, but it's a really hard theoretical problem to figure out how to make this quantum unitary operation actually do something that you care about. And only one answer appears. Okay, so it's kind of subtle. But some examples are uh, factoring large numbers, which I'll just, if we have time, I'll discuss that later. So here's what a quantum computer would look like, just generically. You, you have some inputs, and then each of these qubits can be put into a superposition of zero and one, and all these A's and B's can have different values, you know, di different angles of, of state superposition for each one of these. And then the, the state of this whole combined thing, it's a co composite state. It's, it's this state and 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 this state. So you can see, if you combine all those, there's a huge number of possible combinations. Actually, it's two to the eighth because there's eight of these uh, quantum objects here. Now I take th that state and I, I stick it in, this is my input data, which you have to know how to prepare that to correspond to the, the problem you're trying to solve. And then you have to program all these quantum gates, which are the quantum XOR and the quantum rotates. And then the outputs have to be passed into inputs, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get this entangled state out here. Uh, and so how to extract an answer from this entangled state? Because what you do is you just take each one of these and you measure zero or one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. So you get eight answers, eight numbers. How does that correspond to the answer to a problem that you care about? And more generically, the question is, what kinds of problems can be solved efficiently by a quantum computer as compared to a classical computer? It turns out that most problems of interest cannot be solved efficiently by a quantum computer. You might as well use a classical computer. But there are certain other problems that simply cannot be solved by a classical computer in less than, say, one billion years whereas a quantum computer can solve that problem in a short amount of time. So quantum computers are extremely powerful, but only for certain kinds of problems. So in some cases, you can check the output. So you run this thing and you get some answers out here with some probability, some numbers. Now you wonder, is, is that the right answer? Sometimes you can check whether it's the right answer very easily which I'll explain an example in a second. But if it turned out to be not the good answer, 
you run the computer again and you run it maybe 10, 20, 30 times until the answer you, you get out and you check it. Yeah, that's a good answer. But running the quantum computer 30 times, it certainly does not take 1 billion years. So you still beat the classical computer by a huge amount. Now there's other cases where you cannot actually check if the answer is correct. And I call that a pretty good answer. Here's an example of, uh, of that. Let, let's say you have a scheduling problem. You know, you're United Airlines and, and, and you're trying not to let your airplanes uh, get um, late all the time, like, like they always are. So it's a scheduling problem. You know, if, if one plane breaks down, where should you get the replacement plane? Uh, what, what should be the route of all these airplanes? This is a called logistics. Uh, classical computers can produce answers to that. They, they do it all the time, but we're not very sure if those are very good answers. A quantum computer can actually provide answers to something like that, but we're also not sure if it's a, if it's a good answer. So the only way to find out is to run the quantum computer, get the answer, and then do the experiment. R run United Airlines scheduling for a month using quantum computer outputs and compare that to how it performs using classical computer outputs. And there's no one correct answer. There might be thousands of answers, all of which are almost equally good. And the quantum computer can probably give you one that's much better than the classical computer could. Now the mathematics behind that is very complicated and uh, I can't obviously go through it. But it gives you the idea that quantum computers can be used for decision making. And so it makes you start thinking about artificial intelligence, like self-driving automobiles. Okay. But we have time to run through an, an actual example here. This is called the factoring problem. And this was the first problem in 1994 a mathematician figured out that a quantum computer, if you could build one, could, could find the factors of a large number. If those, if those factors exist, they're called prime factors. So let me explain this if you don't know. A prime number is a number larger than one that can only be divided by one and by itself. I say evenly divided, so you get an integer. So for example, five is prime because five divided by one is five and five divided by five is one. So it's not possible to write five as the product of two integers. That, that's what it means to be prime. Now, here's some examples. 15, I give you the number 15 and I ask you to tell me the prime factors. Well, it's one times three times five, but we don't have to write the one, that's a waste. Okay, so that, that's good. Uh, what about 35? That's five times what? Okay, now your brain is a computer and you can easily compute the answer to that question. There it is, five times seven. What about 105? How fast can your brain compute that? Well, you probably have to use a pencil and paper or a calculator unless you're a math whiz which I'm not. So I'd have to play around quite a while and find out that it's actually three times five times seven. What about 735? That one's gonna take you quite a long time to figure out what prime numbers to multiply together to get that number, right? There's the answer. There's actually two factors of seven in there. Well, it gets progressively more difficult. What are the prime factors of 60? Okay, how would you deduce that? Well, you would just start dividing it. You would first divide by two. Oh yeah, that works, I get 30. Now I divide by three. Oh, that works, 30 divided by three is 10. Now I have 10, now I try to divide that by four. Nope, doesn't work. I divide it by five. Oh yeah, that works, I get two times five. So now I have all the prime factors. See, but you have to do it sequentially and you have to search through all the possibilities. It's very slow and tedious. Okay, here's a nice number. I generate that number by multiplying this one, two, three, four, five numbers together on, on my calculator. 
I got this number. If I hand somebody that number, it's going to take them a really long time, even using a computer. Well, actually, <laughs> if you don't use a computer, it takes you a long time. If you have a, a good computer, you can, you can factor that pretty quickly. What about this number, which I created by multiplying all those integers together? Now, any computer is going to have, start to have a problem figuring out what the factors are. Now, it's important because a lot of your encryption on the internet, when, when you buy uh, an item and, and put your credit card through the, the internet, it's protected by an encryption algorithm, which is based on the difficulty of finding the prime factors of a big number like this. So you're pretty safe. Unless somebody had a quantum computer and they saw this number, may, maybe they could, they could find the factors very quickly. So that's why um, mathematicians are working very hard to find new encryption methods which cannot be cracked by using a quantum computer. And they're making progress on that. Uh, but they wouldn't have had to do that if they didn't know that quantum computers were on the horizon. <clears throat> but this is just a very nice mathematical example. So here's these numbers. And uh, it turns out you can prove mathematically, and I'll demonstrate it, that the time needed to compute, so if you run a computer program, the time it takes to run a program to find the factors of a number that has n um, digits in it. Th these are digits, you can count them up. It looks like about 20 or 30 digits here. n is the number of digits. It's two to the n, okay? I see a question in, in the chat there. Let me see if I can get to it. Nope. Yep, see if there's a question there. Is that why credit cards and debit cards have the numbers on the cards in groups of four for encryption purposes? I would say no. I would say the groups of four are just to make it easier for you to read them over the phone, which you shouldn't do very often, but sometimes you have to. I don't think there's any mathematical significance to that. So if a number has capital N number of digits in the, this is called the target number, the initial number, then it turns out you can show that the time of calculation that's needed to find all the prime factors is uh, proportional to two raised to the power N. Turns out it's actually closer to two raised to the power N divided by three, as I'm gonna demonstrate. And now there's multiplied by some constant C and the value of C depends on how fast your computer is. You know, how many, how many megaflops can it do per second? And what algorithm are you using? So it's just a, a constant factor. But the important thing is how does it scale? It scales exponentially with the number of digits in, 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 in the target number. So let, let's demonstrate that. So I wrote a, actually I didn't write, in Mathematica, there's a program, there's a couple of nice programs, one calls random. So I can create a random uh, integer just by hitting this button here. It spits out a big number. If I hit the button again, it spits out a different big number, et cetera. I can make as many of those as I want. And they're pseudo random. They're not truly random, but I don't care. They're just sort of typical big numbers. Now there's an algorithm called factor the integer. So I stick this, number, X is my big number. I stick it in this little algorithm and it spits out, boom. These are the, um, there's one factor of this, there's one factor of this and there's one factor of this. So it's two times this number times that number equals that number, cool. Well, if this number had, had been prime, you know, just by chance, you can sometimes get a prime number when you do random, it would have said, well, it's just itself and, and, and one, there's no other prime factors. So here's another one. Uh, if I want the size of the number to be 40 digits, I say P is 40. So I, I, I generate X and it has a, it generates a number with 40 digits. I, I, and I, I factor it and I find these are the factors. If I multiply, look at that big crazy number. 
I multiply that times that times that times three, it's going to give me this crazy big number. Now the question is, how long did it take Mathematica on my laptop to to do this operation here? Well, there's a there's a um, there's a thing called um, timing. So timing just uh, looks at the internal clock in the computer, and it spits back and tells you how, how long it took to actually do the uh, the calculation. So I, I ran this 10 times. I generated a random number, and then I factored it. I found, and, and then here's factor integer. And then it spits out the amount of time that it takes to, to do those. I didn't spit out the factors. I spit out the time. These are seconds, 0.13 seconds, 0.7 seconds, 0.2 seconds, 0.005 seconds. And then I calculated the mean or the average of all these, and I got this number, 0.4 seconds. So typically, on average, if I have a 50-digit number, my computer can, can find the prime factors in 0.4 seconds on average. That's pretty fast, right, for a 50-digit number. Well, my computer's fast. It's going to gigaflops. So then I made a plot of the time that it, was take, it took to, to, to um, factor uh, the number on average in seconds, it's, it's here, uh, versus the number of digits. So I took, say, for example, 30 digits, and I, I generated that you know, many, many times, and I got the average time that was small. And when I used a 50 digit number, I did that many times, it took on average 0.8 seconds. Okay, I can, I can zoom into this, uh, I can compress this down to here. If I go to 60, if I go to 70 digits long, it, it takes about 60 seconds. So that's a minute. It takes a minute to factor, you know, to find the prime factors of, of one number. So I had to run this overnight. I told to do thousands of examples overnight. And what did it tell me? Uh, well, that's the same as that, overnight. So it turns out that this number here is approximately two to the sixth. This number here is approximately two to the seven. This is two to the nine. That's 500 seconds. See, that's almost 10 minutes. So overnight it was, it was crunching along and sometimes it took 10 minutes or more to find a factor. So notice that these numbers are growing two, it's going six, seven, nine. The exponent's kind of growing linearly as this size of the number grows linearly. So if you know mathematics, you know log plot. Log plot on the vertical, linear plot on the horizontal. And all these numbers fall on a straight line. So it means the time that it takes to find the factor is growing exponentially with this, as I increase the size of the number. These numbers are the same over here as these numbers are down here. So th this one is 512 seconds. This is one second. Down here is about one millisecond. It's like 10 to the minus 10. It's, it's a very short time. If I just have 10, a digit number, it can factor it in a few milliseconds. But if I have an 80 digit number, it takes uh, 500 seconds. So the whole trick is you just make the number bigger and bigger. Now they use numbers with like 500 digits and that's growing exponentially, you see. So I can fit this uh, nice curve here with a model fit, which is two raised to the power 0.33 n, where n is the size of the number, that's equal to two raised to the power n over three. And then here's my constant, which is in milliseconds. It's, well, in seconds. So this is like less than a, less than a millisecond. And notice that for, every, for the time it takes to compute doubles for every three digits added to my big number. That's what this means. So if my number's not big enough, I just have to add a, 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 you know, three more digits and it's gonna double the time it would take a code breaker to crack it. So here's some, some nice examples. So if the constant is one millisecond, then for, for nine digit number, it takes two to three times one is eight milliseconds. For a 12 digit number, it takes um, two to the four. Well, why is it four? It's because it's 12 divided by three, so 12, divided by three is four, two to the four is 16 milliseconds. For 15 is two to the five. 
milliseconds. For n equals 60, it's 2 to the 20, which is 1,000 seconds. For n is 171, that's 171 divided by 3 is 57. So it's 2 to the 57. That is 10 to the 14 seconds. Hmm. Interesting. It's very easy to write down a number with 171 digits for which I know the prime factors, right? I just pick four large numbers, multiply them together. I get some large number. I give it to you. It's going to take you 10 to the 14 seconds to figure out the prime factors using my laptop. That's the age of the universe. <laughs> okay. So it's not that a classical computer could not do it. It's just that it would take too long to do it. And if you make a faster and faster computer, you just change this factor C here. You don't change the exponential scaling. You just make C smaller. So if I make my computer a thousand times faster, so this is 10 to minus six seconds. Great. That's a really fast computer. That means it only takes 10 to the 11 seconds. That's still billions of years. Okay. Oh, here, here's an example. Yeah, I can make this number here. I know the prime factors. I hand it to you. There's no way you can figure out the prime factors. Okay. But in a, a quantum computer, in a sense, could do this um, by parallel processing. And in fact, it can do it. But the problem is, when you measure the outputs, they're random, right? The Born rule says that the, the output measurement results are, are random given by the, the state amplitudes, the, the possibility projection numbers. So you just get one answer, but it might be the wrong answer. Well, it's very easy to check if it's the right answer. So I give you a large number with 171 digits. I know the prime factors. You run the computer, you get some numbers out here, which are supposed to be the prime factors. You multiply them together, you tell me if you get the right answer, you know, you, you tell me what, I, what you get, and I tell you, yeah, that's the right answer. So that's a way of checking the quantum computer uh, it, it is working. If it fails, you just run the computer again. So maybe you need to run it 30 times, and eventually you get the right answer. So if you're trying to crack, uh, you know, crack uh, uh, Mandy's uh, credit card number, uh, you know, you have to run your quantum computer 10 or 20 or 30 times and, and you keep trying the password and eventually you, you get in. Okay, so, so getting very near the end here, um, this is just showing that the time needed to complete a calculation versus the size n of the data. I showed earlier that for, uh, for a classical computer, the time needed, which is the vertical axis, grows exponentially, the blue, the blue dots, as you increase the size of the number. But a quantum computer, because it has exponential uh, computing power, it, the time it takes to crack the problem is only growing linearly with the size of the number. So you see for small numbers like 40, the classical computer wins by a great amount. The quantum computer is chugging along here very slowly and uh, it loses. But notice, because it's a linear curve and the classical is always an exponential, no matter what the constant C is, C could just push it down a little bit more, you know, blah, blah, down here, but it's always growing exponentially. It's always gonna cross over here. So for a large enough number, like 70, 80, 90, 171, the quantum computer is always gonna win because it takes less time to crack the number to find the prime factors, right? If we make the classical computer 10 times faster, it doesn't help. Instead of 176 seconds, it takes 17 seconds. But now we just increase uh, our target number to 81. So we're up here at 70. See, it takes 176. So we increase our, quant our classical computer speed. So now it's 17. So now the classical computer drops down to here and it beats the quantum computer, which would take 69 seconds. But now we just increase our number to 81 of di digits. And we, uh, the time 81 is now here. So here's 81 and now the quantum computer wins because the classical computer 
takes a lot more time. And like I said, you could keep playing that game. Well, we are now at the end of the term, end of the summer. I hope you've all enjoyed uh, this as much as I have. Are there any questions? We can have a little discussion if you like. 